Hello and welcome to Nursing Pharmacology Anticoagulants. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's take a look at our anticoagulants. First of all, we need to kind of breeze on through here the clotting cascade a little bit and understand that there's more than one way that a clot can form in the body. So we take a look at this picture here, which is really rather simplified as to the process of clotting in our patient's body. And we can see there's two different pathways, an intrinsic pathway and an extrinsic pathway. Uh, one of the things to gather from this is that there's multiple mechanisms for clotting to occur. So if there is, for some reason, one side of this pathway isn't working, or there's a problem that's occurring with a one part of the pathway, there's another component that may cause clotting to occur. This is really important because we don't want our patient to have a little cut on their finger and bleed to death. We want there to be more than one mechanism that is going to stimulate clotting in our patients. Notice that as we go down from our intrinsic and our extrinsic pathways, we come into a common pathway. So this is like the second stage of the clotting process here. It's occurring in the common pathway that is kind of bringing the two together. And then we move down into the formation of the actual clot itself. So we have fibrinogen, which is then forming into fibrin and our cross-linked fibrin, or in other words, our clot. So let's take a look at some of these anticoagulants and how they work. First of all, warfarin is one of the common anticoagulants that we use with our patients. And you can see there's multiple ways that warfarin is working in order to be able to block this clotting cascade. So starting at the top there, there's factor 7, factor 10, factor 9, and then down here into the common pathway with factor 2. So there's multiple ways that warfarin is working in order to be able to block some of these factors in the clotting cascade so that our patient does not develop a clot. By inhibiting these vitamin K mediated pieces of the clotting cascade, warfarin is going to help to prevent clots from occurring. Now it doesn't completely block the clotting cascade, it's just mediating some of this activation of clotting factors. So if our patient is developing clots inappropriately, maybe they have sluggish circulation, or there is an area like maybe a patient with atrial fibrillation and has blood that is kind of sitting and sluggish in the ventricle, hopefully warfarin is going to help to keep that blood from being overly sensitive to clotting. Oftentimes warfarin is used in our patients who have pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis or myocardial infarction. Also in those patients who have cardiac valvular disease and chronic atrial fibrillation. Our side effects are several, including agranulocytosis, anorexia, vomiting, dermatitis, uticaria, and tissue necrosis or gangrene can also occur. Warfarin is going to be based uh, dosed based on the INR. So for most people, it's going to be two to three. In the cases of our patients who have valve replacements, we may bump that up a little bit higher to 2.5 to 3.5. The onset's within about 24 hours, peak is in four hours, and then duration is two to five days. Some nursing considerations, well, there's many drug interactions due to the metabolism of warfarin through the cytochrome P450 pathway. There's also drug herb interactions with ginkgo and others that contain natural anticoagulants. So many of our herbs contain some natural anticoagulants, and that's going to be a problem with any of these anticoagulants, is that we could have an additive effect, and that could lead to some very significant bleeding in our patients. There's drug food interactions, so those foods that are high in vitamin K, including cranberry juice, are going to interfere with how well warfarin works. Vitamin K is used to treat the overdose, so that's our antidote. Our next anticoagulant is heparin, and heparin is going to work by mediating our factor 10A and our factor 2A and this common pathway. This will also help to decrease the formation of fibrin from fibrinogen. 
Heparin deactivates that thrombin, which helps to prevent that conversion, but there's several adverse effects associated with using heparin, including hemorrhage, thrombocytopenia, hyperkalemia, and white clot syndrome. Notice the route with the onset, the peak, and the duration, depending upon whether we're giving it IV or sub-Q. And the interactions, so antihistamines and nitrates can decrease the effect of heparin, so we want to be careful with that, especially if we're starting a new medication in our patient. Other anticoagulants obviously are going to increase the effect that we see from heparin. There's many drug-herb interactions. Again, a lot of our herbs have natural anticoagulants in them, so we have to be careful about that additive effect. Smoking can decrease the therapeutic effect of heparin. And we're monitoring our APTT for one and a half to two times the control is where we want to be in order to maintain an adequate anticoagulant effect. Contraindications are relative to the risk-benefit ratio. So we're always looking at that risk-benefit ratio. Is it worth the risk of the patient having significant bleeding to the benefit of the patient having that heparin and preventing that clot? We use protamine to treat an overdose because that's our antidote. One of the considerations with using heparin is the possibility that our patient could develop a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And what happens in this case here is you see the image at the top is saying that we have heparin, and heparin is going to combine with this PF4. PF4 is an antibody that is then going to develop this complex in IgG that is going to activate platelets. And so we actually start using up platelets, and that's where we end up with the thrombocytopenia, is we're using up platelets as a result of this heparin-mediated complex, this immune complex, that is activating the platelet. Typically, we're going to be concerned about the possibility of a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia if our patient is on heparin and we see about a 30% decrease in the patient's platelet count. We also have direct thrombin inhibitors. These are medications that are going to be affecting factor 13 and factor 2 in our coagulation cascade. These are medications that may be used as an anticoagulant in our patient who has developed a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It's given as an IV infusion, and you can see from the chart at the bottom of the page that we have a pretty immediate onset, peaks within about two to four hours, and the duration is pretty much for the duration of the infusion, and then will start to fade quickly thereafter. Titrate to an APTT of about one and a half to three times control. Our half-life is about 40 minutes. Of course, interactions would be other anticoagulants and herbs that have anticoagulant properties. We also have our factor 10A inhibitors. So these are medications that are going to affect this part of the common pathway in our coagulation cascade. And you can see we have quite a list of different factor 10 inhibitors that we use frequently. These are going to decrease our thrombin-induced platelet aggregation. They're used in atrial fibrillation to try to decrease clot formation, have a half-life of about 10 to 14 hours. And you can see that uh, the peak is about 1 to 2 hours. The duration really is kind of unknown, the onset and the duration. So we don't have good numbers on that, and they may uh, tend to stay in the blood for a longer period of time. Our interactions include other anticoagulants. We have to be careful because uh, these medications can decrease the patient's digoxin level or decrease verapamil levels. We have to be careful with our herbs, especially alfalfa, anise, and bilberry. Another type of medication that's used as an anticoagulant is our antiplatelet agents. These are agents that block the stimulation of platelets. And as you can look at the picture over here on the right, you can see that there's some round looking cells. And then there's those things we typically think of as being platelets. So they're kind of roundish, but they have all these little protrusions sticking out. Well, a platelet normally is going to be round in shape and it's actually slippery. It, it's moving through the bloodstream. It's not attaching to things. If it had all those little protrusions sticking out all the time, we'd constantly be clotting. 
So instead, they're round and they flow through the blood just like our red blood cells do until they become activated. So it's going to be this blockage of the ADP production that is going to help to keep those nice, round, smooth platelets from becoming activated and getting sticky and causing clots. And you can see some examples of different medications that fall under this category here of our antiplatelet agent. Well, to find out more about how you can prevent nursing emergencies in your patients, check out our Nursing Emergencies program. To decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt action with your patients. See it online at thenursingprof.com. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Pharmacology Anticoagulants. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.